are lots of ways that we can inherit traits. So in the previous video, we looked at how we can inherit things through a dominant and recessive pattern. In this video, we're going to look at a bunch of different ways that we can inherit things that are slightly different. We call these non-Mendelian inheritance patterns. The first one we will look at is called polygenic. Poly means many, and genic means genes. Many genes can contribute to the phenotype of a specific trait, like height. In this diagram, you can see there's a whole bunch of people that have stood up and grouped together from the shortest to the tallest. And you can see in this population that there's fewer very short people and fewer very tall people, and more people sort of fit into the intermediate zone, but there is a continuous variation. This population looks more like this graph. You can see there's a whole variation of height from short to tall. This graph is showing a perfect normal curve, but usually a population is going to look, you know, a little bit skewed in one direction or the other. So when you have continuous variation of a trait in a population, that is polygenic. And that means that multiple genes are going to be contributing to that factor. There's a few human traits that are polygenic. So height, weight, um, eye color, hair color, and skin color are a few examples. The next example is called incomplete dominance. When we have an incompletely dominant trait, that means there is an intermediate phenotype. So let's suppose for a flower color, we'll use a big C to indicate color, we can have a red allele or we can have a white allele. When we have a plant, that has two red alleles, the plant will be red. When it has two white alleles, it will be white. But if it has a red and a white allele, then it will look pink. It will have an intermediate phenotype. So if we cross two pink flowers, they are heterozygous, so they have a red allele and a white allele. We figure out the genotypes of the parents, so they're heterozygous. We figure out the gametes they can produce, right? So each flower is going to separate their homologous chromosomes. So each flower can donate a red allele and a white allele. And when we combine those, we will have offspring. If they are homozygous dominant, they will show the red trait. If they are heterozygous, they will be pink. And if they are homozygous recessive, they will show the white trait. So in incomplete dominance, you have an intermediate phenotype. Here in this example, we are going to have a black mouse and a white mouse, and fur color is incompletely dominant. So what is the probability that a black mouse and a white mouse will have gray offspring? We do the steps of a Punnett square the exact same way as we did for the dominant recessive traits. Okay, so we're always going to look for the genotype of the parents. What are the gametes those parents can produce? What are the genotypes of the offspring? And then the phenotypes of the offspring. So figure out the genotypes of your parents. The gametes go on the outside of the box and the offspring go inside the boxes. In our black and white mouse example, we have a black mouse and a white mouse, and we know it's incomplete dominance. So one mouse is going to have black fur, and the other mouse is going to have white fur. What happens when we combine these alleles into the offspring? Every single offspring is going to be a heterozygote. Oops. So every offspring is going to be gray. So what is the probability of a black and white mouse having gray offspring? In this example, 100%. There are roan horses. When you look at them from a distance, they look like they're gray. But if you get up very close, you can see that they have black hair and white hair. This is an example of co-dominance when you express both alleles. So complete dominance, you always show the dominant phenotype unless you have both recessive alleles. 
Incomplete dominance, you have an intermediate. So black and white mice will make gray offspring. But if it's co-dominant, then you're going to express both the black allele and the white allele. In humans, we have an example of co-dominance, and that's our blood types. In the population, we have three different alleles that can combine to give us our blood type. But remember that every single individual person is always going to have two copies of every allele. So if we combine the alleles in different ways, we can have different blood types. The blood types, as you maybe know, are type A, type B, type AB, and type O. The letters indicate an antigen that is on the red blood cell membrane. And this antigen is used by our immune cells to recognize ourself. When you have blood type A, that means you have A antigens being expressed on your red blood cells. If you have type B, then you have B antigens. If you're type O, then you have no antigens. That allele is actually a mutated version of either A or B. So then there is no antigen on the red blood cells if you're type O. And if you're type AB, then you are expressing both alleles. Here we can see the different possible genotypes for blood type. If you have both A alleles, then you are homozygous and type A. If you have an A allele and an O allele, we use the letter I to indicate that an immune response can occur. So the little i means that there is no antigen. So you can have an A allele and an O allele or no antigen, and you will still be blood type A because you're still making A antigens. Okay, but you're a heterozygote. You can be homozygous for type B or heterozygous for type B. A and B are dominant over the O antigen. But when you put A and B together, they are co-dominant. So if you have an A allele and a B allele, then you are type AB. And if you have both of the little I's or both O alleles, then you are type O. So let's do a practice example. Let's suppose mom is type O and dad is type AB. Can they have a baby that is type A blood? Step one, figure out the genotypes of the parents. Mom is type O, so her genotype is going to be little i, little i. Dad is type AB. I don't know why I was doing that. Dad is type AB, so he is going to have an A allele and a B allele. Step two, we figure out the gametes. Mom, let's put mom over here. Mom will have a little i in each gamete, and dad could have either the A allele or the B allele in each gamete. We combine the alleles to produce the offspring. So this offspring could be a heterozygote for type A blood. This one, heterozygote for type B. Here, type A, and here, type B. So what's the probability that these parents will have a baby with type A blood? 50%. The next way that we can inherit traits is called epistasis. The best example of this is Labrador retrievers. We can have black labs, chocolate labs, and golden labs. And how those color allele phenotypes are expressed depends on a modifier gene. So epistasis means that there are two genes that are contributing to coat color. And in animals, fur color is actually determined by epistasis quite regularly. One of the genes is for the pigment or the color, and another gene will determine if that coat color is deposited or not. So in the golden lab, there are two recessive modifier genes, so the color, the pigment, is not deposited in the same way as the other two types of dogs. Epistasis has a modifier gene. Sometimes gene expression can be affected by environmental factors. A couple of cool examples are hydrangea flowers and arctic foxes. Arctic foxes only express their dark fur pigment 
when it is warm. And this helps them blend in with the environment. When it is cold, they don't express those pigment genes, and then they can also blend into the environment in the winter. With hydrangea flowers, hydrangeas are blue when the soil pH is acidic. If the pH is low, the flowers will turn blue. If the pH is alkaline, then they will be pink. Another cool example is the sex of reptiles. Those eggs, when you have eggs in the middle, they're a tiny bit warmer than eggs on the edge. The temperature of the eggs will indicate if those reptiles are going to be male or female. Our last example. We have fruit flies called Drosophila melanogaster. If you've ever examined a fruit fly very closely, you can see that most of the time they have red eyes. Sometimes though, there will be a mutation that causes them to have white eyes. This mutation only occurs in males most of the time. It's possible to occur in females, but it's very rare. How can this be? Where would that gene be if it's only expressed in males? Sex in fruit flies is determined the same way as in people with X and Y chromosomes. So remember that females have two X chromosomes and males have an X and a Y. So where do you think that white eye or red eye allele is located? On the X chromosome. So we call trace like this X-linked. In this example, we have a female fruit fly with red eyes. But she is a heterozygote. She has an X chromosome with a red eye allele and the other X chromosome has a white eye allele. But red is dominant over white, so she is expressing the red eye phenotype. And the male, males have an X and a Y. And this male has the red eye allele. So we have two red-eyed parents. When we do the X-linked Punnett squares, you always want to include the X and Y chromosomes so that you can follow the sex of the offspring as well. Here is the genotype of the mom fruit fly and the genotype of the dad fruit fly. Now they are going to produce gametes. The mom can produce a red-eyed X chromosome or a white-eyed X chromosome. The dad has the red allele on his X chromosome and then he has a Y chromosome. So because he only has one X, Whatever X chromosome he has, that will be the phenotype that he expresses. The sex of the offspring is basically determined by the male because if the dad donates a Y chromosome, the children will be male. If the dad donates an X chromosome, then the children will be female. The mom only donates X's. In this example, if we have a heterozygous red-eyed mom fruit fly and a red-eyed dad fruit fly, they will have 25% chance of a red-eyed homozygous daughter fruit fly. If the red eye allele combines with the mom's white-eyed allele, then we have a heterozygous red-eyed female. Because this female has one of each chromosome, the white eye allele is considered a mutation. When you're a heterozygote like the mom or this offspring, we can also call them carriers. They are not going to express the mutated allele because most often they're recessive, but they are heterozygous, so they do carry the mutated allele. Down here, we have the red-eyed allele with the Y chromosome and the white-eyed allele with the Y chromosome. So what's the probability that these two red-eyed fruit flies can have white-eyed babies? 25%. And it will be male. There are some traits in humans that are on the X chromosome. Color blindness, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and hemophilia. 
In humans, all of those traits are recessive. So for a female to have one of those conditions, she would need both X's to be mutated. So it is possible, but it's just not as common. Let's do an example. Let's suppose dad has hemophilia and mom is not a carrier. Can they have children that have hemophilia? Step one, what are the genotypes of the parents? Let's put dad over here. Dad has hemophilia and he has an X and a Y chromosome. So we'll put a little H on his X to show that he has the hemophilia allele. Mom is not a carrier. So mom will have two healthy X chromosomes. Then we figure out the offspring. Can any of their children have hemophilia? Here, we end up with a daughter, two X chromosomes, that is a carrier. Here, the daughter is a carrier because the dad is donating the X with the mutation. Here, we are going to have males with the healthy normal X chromosome. So is it possible for these parents to have children with hemophilia? No, there is a 0% chance. I wanted to show you one more cool example. There are calico cats that have multiple different ways of inheriting fur color. Calico cats are actually only ever female. Calico is describing the color pattern. It's not a breed of cat, it's how the colors are formed. So calicos have some black and some orange, and sometimes some white, but we'll focus on the black and the orange. If we have a female calico cat, she'll have two X chromosomes, and a male cat will have an X and a Y. Males can't be calico because the black and orange coloring is only X's. So a female can have a black color allele and an orange color allele, and then this will be a female that has black and orange. The male can either be a black cat or an orange cat. So with calico cats, they can inherit their fur color because of X-linked genes, because of co-dominance, and polygenic inheritance because multiple different alleles contribute to their fur color. So that's kind of cool. And one last thing, we're going to look at a summary chart.